This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Chapter 6 looks at some aspects of human resources and management, and some of this should be familiar to you from E1. So we'll just revise a little bit to start with what the human resources cycle is. And the first thing that will happen is that you have to plan the staff you need. Uh, and it's not just numbers of staff, but it's what skills you need and so on. So if your strategic plan was to double uh, sales, double the size of the business within five years, then as well as uh, <coughs> making sure you have resources of non-current assets and management resources, you have to make sure your human resources themselves are probably roughly double if you're doubling the size of the business. And you have to begin planning the acquisition of these people. And that is then advertising and selecting them, and then they will be employed and you have to try and maximize their performance. And usually there's an appraisal process which uh, addresses a number of issues. First of all, there is what should the rewards be, both for next year, maybe last year's bonus or profit-related pay of some sort. Uh, but also we'll be thinking uh, what uh, uh, will this person be doing in the future? What's their development going to be? Are we going to send them on courses, second them to a department for three weeks or whatever it's going, uh, whatever they're interested in? Perhaps they're going to be in line for some promotion. So recruitment and uh, selection. Uh, human resources are a very scarce resource, very tenuous. Uh, it's they're the only ones really of your valuable resources who leave your premises in the evening and there's no guarantee they're going to come back and they might even decide to relocate themselves to a competitor. So we have to define what our requirements are, the planning stage, attract applicants and then to select them. And what we have to do is first of all find out what is the job to which they are going to be recruited because the title of the job, for example accounts assistant, doesn't really define very much about what qualities and skills these people will need. In one organization, accounts assistant might just be doing the debits and the credits. Uh, in another, the accounts assistant might be closely involved with budgeting and have to have good Excel uh, uh, skills and, and, and so on. So what we do is we analyze the nature of the job, what really lies behind the title, and from the analysis process, we can develop a job description, the content of the job. And once we know the content of the job, uh, we can decide uh, what attributes a successful candidate would, would have. And that's the person specification. And sometimes the uh, acronym bad pigs is used to, to, to think about the various qualities of a person. Uh, and the B is their background. A little bit cautious about that, but background could be relevant in terms of maybe where you live. So if you're being employed, uh, maybe as a doctor in a hospital or something to do with kind of health and safety in a large organization, there might be some sort of requirement that you live within, live within maybe 15 kilometers of the hospital or the factory so that you can be on call or you can you know arrive there very, very quickly if there's some sort of emergency. Achievements is the A. Achievements uh, is your qualifications, your skills. Maybe whether or not you have a driving license, that can be a, a, a you know, required achievement for some sorts of jobs. D is your disposition, your kind of outlook. Uh, to some extent, you know, are you happy working on your own or do you always require more or less the company of others to keep you sane? Are you fairly cheerful, sociable, or are you more of a an introvert. It's not necessarily that one is right and one is wrong, uh, but certain jobs do tend to require different personalities. The, uh, the P is physical, uh, not relevant for many jobs. Indeed, we have to be careful not to discriminate against people uh, who may be disabled. But for some jobs, the uh, some of the physical attributes are very, very relevant indeed. For example, uh, airline pilots have to have good airsight. Uh, uh, airline pilots have to have good eyesight, and they can't be colorblind. They have to know the red and the green, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. The next one, the I, is the uh, interest. This is your outside interest, your hobbies, and really, people want to see if your interests seem to be consistent with other aspects of your personality and maybe the sort of job you're going to be looking for. G is general intelligence. 
Uh, many jobs now require people to go in courses almost every year to keep up to date or to keep qualified. And you have to make sure that the, the person is uh, up to that. And finally, there can be special aptitudes, aptitudes for language maybe, uh, aptitudes for uh, computer programming and, and, and so on. Uh, sometimes uh, employers like to see a special uh, aptitude before they will take employees on. After you advertise and, and, and so on, the, you get the replies, you pick a short list of the replies and you'll nearly always interview um, candidates. Interviews can be very badly done. Uh, they will not always uh, reveal who the best candidate is. Sometimes the interviewers are bad at it. Sometimes the candidates can simply act for the half hour of the interview and so on. And increasingly, employers therefore subject candidates to selection tests of various sorts. So there's uh, psychometric uh, tests which uh, assess people's personality, uh, like uh, their ambition, their initiatives and so on. Uh, proficiency, if somebody says they can work Excel well, if they can do pivot tables and uh, the like, well, it's not going to take you very long to find out. Why take the risk? Uh, there will be intelligence tests and finally there can be aptitude tests. Also for some sort of jobs, work sampling is used. If you're going to be uh, recruiting a designer, maybe a website de designer, uh, then you might ask to see screenshots of uh, previous work which they've done so you get an idea of their capabilities. Remember, if you recruit the wrong people, it's very expensive. Not so much in getting rid of them, but because you've wasted time you need somebody and quite often before you can recruit somebody and maybe three months has gone by by the time you've formulated what you need, you've interviewed them and so on and so on. And if you get the wrong person then another three months has to be kind of taken up and you want this person, you need this person for your business. Group selection methods are like very, very sophisticated um, methods. Sometimes it can take two or three days. Uh, they are used normally where the employee is going to be of such importance you want to be sure you get them right. Uh, and Typically what you have is a group of people, you take them away for a weekend, they've got kind of group exercises, team exercises, uh, case studies to um, solve and they're observed to, to see how they maybe lead the group and deal with discussions and overcome objections and uh, how, how good they are at inspiring others and so on. Uh, and then at some point after the person has been offered the job and they say yes then it's advisable to take up references with their current employers factual stuff like when did they join uh, what's their salary what's their current grade and so on uh, ought to be uh, really checked to, to make sure they're not inflating some of their qualifications uh, training, development and education, okay, and this is from E1, just very quickly. Training, if you remember, is really instantly needed for your current job. You're probably going to use that tomorrow. Development is much more longer term. Uh, it's often associated with uh, the phrase management development. You're a manager. At some point, you're going to have to interview potential candidates. You might not be doing it for a year, but at some point you will have to be doing that. Uh, and as, as well to have that sort of skill in your in, in your armory, really. Similarly, making presentations, uh, perhaps to clients, is something you might have to do at some point, not too far in the future, even though we can't really put a particular date on it. That tends to be development. And not quite so important, the definition of education is knowledge acquired gradually through learning and instruction. Types of training, again, a kind of revision. Uh, you can be sent out on a formal course, given lectures for two days. You can shadow people, follow your boss around for, for a month, seeing how he or she operates. Temporary promotion, acting manager, acting supervisor. It's great until that ends and you kind of go back down to where you were. Computer-based uh, training can deliver training on demand, uh, just-in-time training it's sometimes called. And where this uh, syllabus gets a little bit more interested is, is in mentoring and coaching. So what is a mentor? And very definitely a mentor is not your line boss. A mentor should not be your line boss. 
the idea is, uh, I think, uh, that the, the mentor uh, we have here in this last phrase, which we've got down here, uh, the mentor should be like a friend, a confidant in the organization, somebody you can go to with certain problems or doubts, speak to them confidentially, knowing that it's not going to end up your, in, in your employment record or uh, it's not going to maybe affect your chances of promotion. You can't really do any of that with your line boss, no matter how sympathetic the line manager is. Uh, there's always a thought in the back of your mind that this person will be taking my questions on board. They will remember that. Uh, and when it comes maybe to promotion, they will remember oh, he asked, had to ask me about that or he had some, some kind of personal problems I had to deal with. Uh, and therefore that would stop you being frank and maybe stop the help coming. So you want somebody who's uh, uh, not your line manager, someone a little bit more senior than, than you, could be somebody of the same grade, but probably about a year in front of you, because what, what they're helping you through really is, is it's almost the teething problems. Uh, you join a company, it's different people, different rules, maybe you're doing a different job, and they've been quite, quite a lot to learn, quite difficult to find your feet. So this uh, person can give you confidential uh, and kind of trustworthy practical advice, maybe in how to organize your time better. Counseling, what happens if you're not getting on with your colleagues very well, you don't get on with your boss very well and so on. How should you, how should you cope with those sort of uh, tensions? I may also give you guidance on analyzing your own performance so you can have a, a you know, realistic uh, appraisal uh, or, or can tell you, you know, this is what you should be doing, this is what you are doing, there's a bit of a gap there and, and so on. All of this without it ending up in your uh, employee record and perhaps having an impact later on. Many organizations are beginning to uh, have this idea of mentoring and it's, it doesn't really cost very much. You're not employing somebody specially to do it. Uh, it's, it's, it's maybe, you know, maybe it starts off being a a half hour meeting every week or something but but probably then as time goes on the the the, the mentor doesn't need to be quite so hands-on coaching is a very valuable form of training coaching is sometimes called on the job uh, training or in the workplace uh, training you're not sent out to somewhere to get lectures which may not be quite what you need uh, basically uh, you you accompany uh, your supervisor or your supervisor keeps a very close eye on you uh, and explains what to do, looks at what you've done, maybe suggests better ways of doing it, and you gradually learn on the job. Uh, it's the way in which uh, auditors learn their craft. They do learn, obviously, a certain amount of theoretical stuff. But when it actually comes down to doing an audit, uh, there's usually a, a senior in charge or a supervisor with two assistants and the supervisor will act as a coach for these assistants, will tell one to go and do the bank reconciliation, show that trainee how to do it, uh, review what they've done, say where well, they've not done it right, and, and, and so on, and provides very, uh, very memorable training, really, very practical, memorable training uh, on the job. Performance appraisal is uh, very important in organisations. And its aim is twofold. First, to improve organizational performance. Uh, organizations really perform through people, and one of the aims of appraising people is to get better results from the organization. Uh, the other uh, part of uh, appraisal is to help to develop individuals, uh, that they become better, they become maybe more motivated, and so on. And if appraisal is done well, it should, should uh, uh, address and attack both of these requirements. The uh, general aim, apart from improving organizational performance and improving people's performance, uh, it tend, they tend to look at three elements. First of all, there is the reward. What are you going to be paid next year? And maybe what is your bonus last year? There is your performance from last year. And then there is letting you know your potential, uh, what you might be doing next year, what the company's plans uh, have for you. Now, those are probably the three common components of most appraisals. Some experts, however, would say you shouldn't have that one in there. Uh, 
you shouldn't be fixing people's pay at the same time that you are uh, reviewing their performance because there's, there's more to pay than performance uh, I mean a company cannot pay more than it can afford so the, the economics and its competitive position has a, a bearing on pay there is no point in paying really an employee more than their worth more than you know the going rate uh, for that sort of work is uh, why, why would I pay this point this person let's say 15,000 if I could, could recruit another person at about 10,000 and it's very easy for salaries to kind of get out of line like that uh, you have somebody employed with you for five years a good worker uh, every year you give them an inflationary rise plus a bit more for being a, a good worker and by the time you compound up five years worth of these uh, pay rises uh, you can easily find they're kind of being paid 50% above what a, a new recruit might be being paid. And finally, uh, not all organisations have got complete freedom about pay because certainly larger organisations you have a grade uh, and as long as you're in that grade you're in a, a pay band. And unless there's a way of promoting you, it doesn't matter how good you are, once you're up against that ceiling of the pay band, you're kind of stuck. And therefore, these, these people would say you should keep the reward process like almost about six months out of phase with the appraisal of the performance and potential because it doesn't look too good if you praise somebody to the, to the skies, so to speak, and you're really good at this. And then you say, uh, but uh, there's only an inflationary pay rise this year. It, it, it maybe doesn't be quite so convincing. What you need to do to carry out the appraisal interviews, uh, your manager needs to prepare. The manager needs to, to look back at what was said at last time's appraisal interview. The manager needs to gather information. How have you actually performed during the year? Uh, and they have to go out and talk to colleagues and clients and so on to get a, a feeling about how you've actually performed. Then is the, the interview, the three main types of interview. The manager can tell you what he or she thinks and just just sells that to you, just kind of convinces you. It's really a one-way street of communication. A little bit better is that tells and listen. So the manager knows what he or she thinks uh, and tells it to you, but then you can reply and you can say, I don't think that's quite right and that's not quite fair and so on. But for both of these, the, because the, the manager has kind of made up his or her mind beforehand, they tend to be reluctant to change really their views. It's almost an admission they're wrong. Uh, and no matter how much they listen to you, they probably don't alter your, your assessment very much. Problem solving is supposed to be far better in terms of communication. Problem solving is like you go into your manager and in front of the manager is nearly a blank sheet of paper. Uh, there's a list of headings down the side uh, uh, of, of various qualities. So one of the headings might be technical ability. So your manager says to you, well, what do you think your technical ability is? Let's, let's mark it from minus five, really, really bad, to plus five, fantastic. And you say, uh, oh, I think my technical ability is about mm, plus three. And the manager was saying, well, mm, I was thinking maybe more plus one. Uh, uh, nothing's been written down yet, uh, uh, but uh, because nothing's been written down, then there's a little bit more flexibility, and you can discuss with each other why one of you thinks it's plus three and one of you thinks it's minus or plus one. And you know, it may go up to plus three, it may go to two, it may go to, to one, but you've gone through this process of discussing and problem solving what the issues are. Then you have to, to plan, you have to plan really the future, plan improvements. So if your technical ability is only plus one and your manager wants it up a bit, you have to think how you're going to do that. Maybe maybe it's sending you on a course, maybe it's getting you to practice more with that. You agree what's going to be done and then it should be summarised in writing. Okay. And the in, in writing uh, would be kind of a basis of a report. Uh, the report will be filed in your personnel file and you should get a copy of it as well uh, really as a reminder of what was said and in particular maybe a reminder 
about what you've promised to, to get better at. And also maybe a reminder to the manager, yes, I'm going to present this person on a course and here's the written evidence that we agreed that. And then there is the, the follow-up actually doing it, putting that person on a course, improving, monitoring progress and so on to make sure that the uh, promised achievements, if you like, are actually realised. And this should help both you know, these twin objectives of appraisal to improve organisational performance and also to develop the individual by making them better. Now, not all appraisals go smoothly uh, and Lockett uh, has suggested six ways uh, in which uh, the appraisal process can be less than perfect. And the first one is confrontation. Uh, where basically the manager and the subordinate kind of fall out and they have an argument or a, certainly a, a strong disagreement over what's being said. It, it could be that the manager is, is kind of uh, uh, taking a, a kind of tell and sell approach and the subordinate simply doesn't accept what the manager is saying. And this kind of confrontation here and emotions rise and once emotions rise then you are almost capable of taking good advice on board and coming to a, a, an agreement of what should be happening, you're going to leave the appraisal feeling really fed up. It's certainly not developing you. Uh, and it's difficult to see how your performance is going to improve to help the organization. Judgment is it's got, got kind of overlaps with this. Judgment uh, is where the manager maybe makes accusations against you almost. Uh, which are too subjective, saying that you haven't performed very well, but can't really maybe back that up uh, with very much evidence, being very kind of judgmental. And also kind of blaming you a lot uh, for where you didn't do well, uh, and maybe not praising you enough where you did do well. Remember, the, the, the objective of an appraisal isn't to just blame people and kind of uh, chastise people, tell people off that they haven't done well. Uh, you want a win-win out of it. You, you you may have to tell them you didn't do so well, but it has to be done in quite a, a kind of supportive way. Uh, and, and really, instead of saying what went well and what went badly, you, you know, appraisers are taught language like, well, what went well, and then what didn't go so well. So, so the criticism is very, it's there, uh, but it's... Um, I don't know, gentle is the right word, uh, but it's not criticism that, that's likely to back you into a corner and lead to confrontation. Chat's almost the opposite. Uh, chat is where the, the manager is reluctant to really pass any judgment at all, or to make any criticism at all. So you have this kind of friendly chat, uh, but, but nothing useful really comes out of it. Bureaucracy and event are quite closely linked. Bureaucracy is really the form of assessment where the manager is almost obsessed with getting these forms filled in and making sure everything's been signed off. And event is really people doing an appraisal because we always do them in March every year. And we'll come in, we'll do the appraisal. We don't plan it very much. We don't follow it up very much. Uh, but at least we know we've had this year's appraisals uh, without really thinking what should be coming out of them. And finally, unfinished business. This is where the, uh, the follow-up on the appraisals, the arranging of courses, the arrangement of the secondment to another department simply don't take place. Uh, and this is liable to make employees very cynical indeed about uh, appraisals. Health and safety. Health and safety work is very important. Uh, apart from the moral uh, incentives, uh, there are great financial incentives because... Uh, in many countries, if employers get uh, employees get injured at work, then employers have to pay a fantastically high amount in uh, damages. So, employers' duties: uh, all work practices must be safe. Uh, so, nowadays in in the UK, uh, it, it's almost impossible uh, for it to be regarded as being safe for an employee to go up a ladder. Okay, then go up a ladder, maybe to change a light bulb. Uh, but going, you know, much above a couple of meters uh, is now kind of regarded as not being the safe way to be to be dealing with height, work at height, 
uh, and scaffolding might be required. So once you get up to having to you know, paint the windows on the first floor, then maybe it requires scaffolding because the, the dangers associated with you know stretching and falling off a ladder are really quite quite high. The work environment must be safe and healthy. You know, not too warm, not too cold, not too much dust, not too much noise, uh, not too much pollution, uh, and and so on. Plant and equipment must be properly maintained. So in the UK, every few years, every electrical device has to be inspected. Every plug and socket has to be inspected uh, to make sure nothing's kind of come loose inside, which may be a, an electrocution danger to people using it. We should train people. We have to give instructions, make instructions that are available to encourage safe working practices. There are many training uh, courses on being safe at work. People have to be told what the uh, policy on uh, on safety is. Uh, so you would be telling people, you know, if you see anything that looks damaged or dangerous, you have to report it. You'll be telling people you must follow the particular rules and regulations to do with the machinery you're working. You mustn't uh, pay, play pranks on colleagues which may be dangerous. And employers must carry out risk assessments. You have to actually carry out risk assessments for almost everything an employee does because the idea is until you've at least thought about what the employee does and thought about the risks, you can't be sure there aren't any. It might be that having considered the risks, you decide there are no risks worth, worth, worth bothering about there uh, and no special training or, or safety devices are needed. But you have to kind of throw the net very wide to see what could possibly go wrong with this simple task. Uh, and then, you know, if nothing can go wrong with it, you know, you can say that on the piece of paper where your risk assessment is actually being carried out and being recorded. Following on with employers' uh, duties, uh, you should share any inf information you come across with others. So let's say you're two departments, one sees a particular hazard with maybe as per process, uh, then they should share that information with another branch or another department which has a similar process. Introduce controls to reduce risk. So you would tell people you mustn't have cables going across the floor. You tell people if you spill a liquid on the floor, you must immediately put up one of the little kind of yellow signs saying you know, cautious wet floor and, 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 and so on. Uh, you would be insisting that people had uh, fire drills every week or every month or whatever was thought, uh, was thought to be required. We should keep safety policies under review and we should in particular uh, be on the lookout for staff who are maybe particularly at risk from certain processes and certain types of work. You have to employ competent uh, safety and health advisors if were necessary. So if you're in certainly a chemical works uh, where there are dangerous chemicals around, you would need professional help to give you advice. You know, if somebody gets splashed with this chemical uh, or happens to ingest it in some way, you know, what is the emergency treatment? Employers, you know, will not know that themselves. So they have to uh, get professional advice on that. And this will be, uh, of course, put, put into the, the safety policies and, and so on, uh, and uh, written, written instructions to people. There will be a safety representative. This is somebody on the employee's side, could be a trade union uh, person, who looks out for the safety of uh, employees there. And there will be a safety committee where both the safety representatives and management meet and they can discuss maybe issues of safety, maybe how a recent accident happened, uh, how they should progress in the future to make sure everyone's working safely. Now, not all the responsibility are, is on employers. Employees also have a responsibility. For example, they have to take reasonable care of themselves and others. You're not supposed to do you know, really daft things. Uh, if you uh, deliberately go against instructions and safety instructions, then you know that that is actually a breach of discipline, uh, and you could be d dismissed for that. Certainly, 
you know, if it's putting others at risk, it's probably known as gross misconduct. You have to allow employers to carry out uh, their duties, particularly enforcing safety rules or maintaining machinery. So if an employer says you have to stop working this machine because it's not safe, you know, you, you have to let them in there to fix a thing. You're not allowed to interfere intentionally or recklessly with machinery. So you're not allowed to say, take guards off the machine. Uh, if there's a guard there for safety to stop you know, people people getting caught up in a machine, you know, taking that off maybe to help you work faster would be a disciplinary offence. Similarly, the bottom one here, these kind of two in a way kind of come together a little bit, using all equipment properly. Uh, so, uh, for example, I have a friend who runs a printing business, and in the printing business there are large guillotines, big blades which come down and slice paper, really. And obviously there, there is a danger because when this big blade comes down to somebody whose hand was in there, they, would, they could have serious damage. And so the way the machine is set up to bring the blade down, apart from there being guards and so on, but before the blade can come down, the employee has to press two buttons uh, and they're like arms width apart. So you have to press with both fingers simultaneously. You, you get about a quarter of a second difference. So you can't go that, that. You know, it has to be both together. And this means, of course, if you're pressing the buttons, your hand can't be in the machine. But he was saying, you know, what the guys do to, I suppose, speed things up for themselves, is you press one button with a finger, and they kind of press the other, they put their leg up with their foot up, and they press the other button with their foot on the bench, and, the, you know, the hand could still be in there. Now, that is not using equipment properly. Those would be, and must be, really, disciplinary offences. They have to be brought to somebody's attention. They have to be warned. You keep doing that, you're going to be sacked. Uh, because health and safety is not a trivial issue. Equal opportunities. In the UK, uh, we have equal opportunity uh, laws uh, surrounding uh, race. And we when we talk about equal opportunities, we, we mean recruitment, we mean promotion, we mean pay, we mean being given opportunities to go on courses and, and, and so on. Uh, so you have to be careful not to discriminate between people on the basis of race or sex, uh, or disability, and in the UK the requirement is that companies make reasonable adjustments to accommodate people who are disabled. Now what is a reasonable adjustment? Well, uh, if it was a small company, let's say four people employed, and you had some machinery upstairs, and you had maybe the, the shop or something downstairs, and you're employing someone to work machinery, and somebody comes along in a wheelchair. Now, a very small company, four people employed, that uh, firm would not be expected to kind of bring all the machinery downstairs, nor would they be expected to install a lift, because that would be you know, to, to let the person in the wheelchair go upstairs, because that would be prohibitively expensive. However, if instead of four people being employed, there was maybe 100 or 200 people being employed, uh, then a reasonable adjustment would be you will put a lift in the building so that anyone who is in a wheelchair can in fact go up to the first floor where they can work. So it's a fairly elastic uh, 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 definition, if you like, but reasonable adjustments are required. Nor are we allowed to discriminate on the basis of religion or uh, sexual orientation or age. And I think age was probably the last one to be going into the legislation. So if you're thinking of promoting someone, you have someone who's maybe 60 and somebody who's maybe 26, uh, then you can't say, well, I give the promotion to the 26-year-old because this person might be here for 10 years, whereas if I give it to the 60-year-old and they're going to retire when they're 65, they're going to be there for five years. We're not allowed to do that. Uh, although, of course, there may be ways around it. Uh, basically what you can do is you can um, you know maybe formulate the person's specification uh, cle cleverly and maybe unfairly but so that the younger person is favored if you find you are discriminated against well potentially there are three sorts of discrimination 
direct discrimination uh, is where you would say something like in an advert salesman required okay the use of salesman is direct discrimination and to avoid that you would have to say something like salesperson or sales representative required it has to be gender neutral the only times you can directly discriminate is if you're employing someone in someone in your home so if you wanted someone to look after your children you could specify a, a woman uh, where there's a, a genuine requirement for it to be person to be one sex to the other so if you were a, a theater director putting on romeo and juliet you are allowed to insist that romeo is played by a female performer and the other main reason is for reasons of uh, dignity and decency if you're employing someone to work let's say in uh, uh, to look after elderly people and all the elderly people were female uh, then you'll be allowed to insist that uh, care assistants were all female because it might be uncomfortable to those residents and might not be particularly decent uh, if they had a, a male nurse or something uh, of that sort uh, looking after the, the sort of duties that would have to be carried out. Indirect discrimination is uh, where you are liable actually to, to come across most discrimination be very subtle. So indiscri indirect discrimination will be saying something like sales representative required must be two meters tall with a large black beard. Uh, you haven't specified male, uh, but obviously the chances are that uh, this role is going to be much more easy to fulfill if you're male and if you're female. And that's the nature of indirect discrimination, where for one race or one sex, male, female or something, uh, there's going to be more or easier for those candidates to fulfill it. And this can, this can be really quite subtle, and this is where companies get into the bother, there was one company, and this was before age discrimination came out, but it wanted to send what you might call its high flyers on a course. And it specified that to go on this course, you have to uh, be a manager and you have to be on the 30. And that was held to be discriminatory against women uh, because most or many women uh, will have had a couple of years out of work maybe to bring up children for a couple for, for, for two years or maybe until they go to school or they come back part-time for a little while and, and, and so on uh, and if you're going to be both a manager and on the 30 uh, then it's harder to 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 get those criteria met together if you are a woman uh, so, so maybe what they should have said to go on this course you must be a manager uh, and men must be on the 30 and maybe women have to be on the 33 to make some adjustment uh, for the potential indirect discrimination. Victimization. Victimization is where someone has taken you to an employment tribunal and these here would ultimately go to what's called a tribunal which is a kind of court. So uh, an employee has alleged uh, some sort of discrimination that they weren't promoted when they should have been uh, and maybe the tribunal has uh, found for the employee and they come back to work and then because of course they've taken you to court and, and damn it they've won uh, you get your own back on them by kind of being a bit nasty to them uh, and that is known as victimization and that is also a crime diversity diversity is kind of very much linked to the idea of no discrimination and what it means is ensuring that the composition of the workforce reflects the population as a whole. Uh, and uh, obviously by not having sex discrimination, not having race discrimination, not having age discrimination, religious discrimination, you should be promoting gradually the idea that the workforce should be kind of representative of the population. And this is thought to be good obviously for maybe moral purposes that it's unfair to exclude certain areas of society from from the job but it can be defended if you like or supported on absolutely profit and loss kind of basis here 
And it's this second one here, a diverse organization will better understand and meet the needs of customers. Well, that's certainly one uh, e example, but let's, let's go through all of them. So let's say uh, you take me, uh, assume I'm from obviously a kind of white middle class background. Uh, and there are people from very different backgrounds around, from different uh, racial backgrounds, different countries maybe, uh, from different educational backgrounds, uh, from different kind of family backgrounds. And I grow, go and recruit someone, and because I'm a bit prejudiced, I recruit somebody in my own image, like me. Now you have to think, uh, what's the advantages of having two of me with the same skills and outlooks in one business? Would it not be better to have one of me with my particular skills and outlooks, and maybe one of somebody else who adds a bit of variety to that, and maybe actually adds a bit of challenge to some of my ideas? But just getting more of the same is maybe not the best way to recruit. Secondly, you have to bear in mind uh, who your customers are. So, so let's say I, again, my white middle class background, am trying to sell to uh, people from some sort of uh, minority section of society who, who's not white middle class. Uh, now, wouldn't they look at me a bit oddly? Here, here's a company, and maybe I've been just recruiting people like me. Here's a company, all white, trying to sell, all from particular educational kind of backgrounds and social strata, whatever, trying to sell to other people who are really quite different. That's not going to presumably work quite so well. Uh, you might sell better to people who felt a kind of affinity with the company. And the third reason why diversification is maybe better, or diversity is maybe better, is it simply widens the pool of talent from which you can recruit. So if you're really not going for diversity at all, and I, okay, this is illegal because I'm only going to employ men, then, then you're kind of cutting your potential recruits in half because of not having females. Or if, if you say, uh, let, let's take a firm of accountants, they have a, let's say, a very skilled tax manager, let's say a woman. Uh, she um, takes a couple of years off maybe to have a couple of children. And you say, you know, come back, come back to, to work. Uh, but you have to come back Monday to Friday and nine to five. And, you know, the, there's, there's a big chance that this uh, woman will say, look, I can't do that. It means I have to commute a lot every day. Uh, it means, I, you know, I have to find, I won't be seeing my children, I'll find childminders and so on. I simply won't work. And maybe what we should do to encourage a lot of diversity is to make the employment practices more flexible. Why not say to somebody, well, better part-time than not at all. Why don't you work maybe from nine to two every day? Or why don't you work three days a week from home uh, and only have to come into the office two days a week? I mean, you're simply widening the net. Uh, uh, and rather than kind of cutting out a huge amount of talent, which is there, he was kind of saying, well, maybe I could go a lot of the way to recruit back into work these people whom I know are very, very talented. So diversity is, is, is big business. The final thing I would say is it's very good PR. Uh, it's good uh, public relations for the employer. Uh, other employees see that you seem to be fair and open. Customers see that you are fair and open. And maybe collaborators see that you are fair and open. Uh, and it's a kind of maybe the modern way to go that people will feel much more comfortable with. Disciplinary procedures, uh, when the employee does something wrong. Now, we're jumping in here at the first written warning, and actually before that is a couple of other processes. Let's say somebody comes in late. The first thing you might say to them uh, is, we might have a, what's called an informal verbal warning. You just kind of say, oh, you're late today, why is that? You're just kind of letting them know you know, you know. But that's probably not going to be recorded anyway. It's just kind of a little shot across the barrels. And then they, the next day they come in late. And then it becomes what's called a, a formal verbal warning. You say, look, I'm giving you a formal warning now. You've been late two days in a row. Uh, the fact that I've given you this warning is going to be recorded in your personnel records. 
and then if they come in late again uh, there is a first written warning you're not just telling them they were late and they shouldn't be you're actually giving a piece of paper warning them uh, you mustn't be late you've done it a few times now and they do it again then you can have a second written warning this is the final written warning this says final written warning and tell somebody if they commit this offense again then the next step can be suspension the motion or dismissal now that seemed kind of clear clear cut uh, but maybe not uh, you have to think uh, okay lateness you'd expect kind of instant improvement but what happens if the the warning is in the nature well you're not doing your job very well you're not doing it very efficiently uh, what you have to do is you have to, to give them a, a time in here and maybe training to improve. You can't say you're bad today and then if they're still bad tomorrow, that's not quite fair. Uh, but if you say, oh, you're not very good at that, I'm giving you a warning and I'm sending in a training course. And then I'll give you a week to improve. And if they're still bad at it, uh, then maybe the second written warning would be fine. So room for improvement and support for improvement. And you also have to think, we give somebody a first written warning and then a final written warning, and they get better, and they're fine, for a year. And then a year later, they start coming in late again. Uh, is this, you know, is it tagged on, if you like, to the last written warning, because he did of that? Or does the passage of time, it's been a year since they kind of committed that, that, that kind of disciplinary uh, action, a uh, year's passed, should we kind of start the process again? So there's some myths and bots about it. The important thing is that it's really seen to be fair. That's the kind of criteria that the tribunal will apply. That it's been fair to the employee. There are, however, some forms of uh, misbehaviour or misconduct which are so serious they can lead to actual instant dismissal you know, go now do not pass go do not collect 200 pounds leave the premises now and examples of that would be if you were to hit uh, maybe a colleague hit a customer uh, some serious breaches of health and safety uh, would also maybe lead to gross misconduct uh, and instant dismissal what you should do if you're going through this you must establish the facts as far as you can you must inform the employee that there's going to be a hearing a, a meeting because you don't just give out these warnings as though it was kind of the truth uh, you have to hear everybody's side of the story so it was a hearing uh, and at the disciplinary hearing the employee can bring in a representative to to speak on their behalf and so on so you've heard one side of the story now the employee gives the other side of the story you come to some sort of judgment and maybe you issue the written warning uh, and then the employee has uh, the right to appeal grievance procedures are kind of coming from the other side disciplinary tends to be the employer complaining about employees grievance is really employees uh, uh, complaining about some usually action that's been taken by the employer uh, maybe the employer they, they think hasn't promoted them uh, correctly uh, uh, or maybe the grievance is that the employer has moved from another office and now they've got huge com commutings to do uh, and there's no financial compensation for that so a means of uh, dealing with a dispute employers must set out clearly how employees can go to the grievance procedure and who to contact to kind of initiate it. Could be somebody in the personnel department they go to first. Many grievances might be quickly settled. So maybe the employers, the employees' grievances that they are have a desk near a radiator, they don't like a radiator, don't like the heat all the time, they find it uncomfortable, gives them headaches, and that's their grievance. And that would be easily solved, presumably by, by switching around the position of their desk and, and so on. So you try to deal with it informally, uh, but uh, if you can't come to some sort of uh, mutually acceptable change, then there will be a grievance hearing, a, a little kind of meeting. And you uh, tell the employee when it's going to happen. They're allowed to bring along a, a, a colleague or a union representative 
uh, you will hear their side of the story and so on. You will come to a decision. Uh, and again, uh, whether to move that desk or not. And again, the employer uh, has to give the employee the possibility of appealing against some decision which is being made. Employment protection. The, the law takes the view in the UK that uh, a person's job belongs to the uh, employee and the employer therefore needs to have valid reasons for taking it away from them. So there are three ways in which uh, employment can be uh, terminated. Uh, the employee can uh, retire, the employee can resign, or what's really important, and those that could be non-controversial, where the controversy arises is where the employee is dismissed. This is through employer action. And it can be uh, termination of your job, which is mainly the sack, some, somewhere or other. It can be non-renewal. So if you are employed on a contract for three years, and after the three years the employer does not renew it, then that is dismissal and you may have action against the employer. So the idea of a temporary contract doesn't really exist. And finally, there is what's called constructive dismissal. And this is where the behaviour of the employer has been so outrageous uh, that the employee is entitled to assume uh, that they have been sacked. So what is uh, what makes dismissal fair and unfair? So fair dismissal, redundancy. So the business is cutting back, it slows down a branch, those jobs have disappeared, those people can be made redundant, they can be dismissed. There'll be some compensation to pay, uh, but, but it's not regarded as being unfair dismissal. It'll be beyond the compensation, there's going to be no other damages. What you need to be careful about there is that the selection for redundancy is fair. You can't just make all the female workers redundant and keep all the male ones, and, and typically employers adopt some sort of scheme like first a big one last in first out the most recent employee is the first one to be sacked you can be dismissed through a legal impediment so you're a van driver and you lose your driving license how do you go you can't carry on your job uh, and it's perfectly fair for the employer to sack you non-capability you're incompetent you can't do the job for some reason Maybe you should never have been recruited, but the employer can get rid of you, provided the employer has given you the opportunity and the means to try to improve. And this can even work where maybe an employer changes the technology. So everyone's been working kind of manually, getting on fine, and then the employer brings in a, a fancy kind of digitally controlled machine, and an employee can, can't work this, can't, can't get the hang of it, then they again can be dismissed after you've given them a reasonable chance of improvement. Misconduct we've looked at, uh, either the, the gradual letters of warning or gross misconduct, or another substantial reason. For example, you have the uh, salesman in one company married to a saleswoman in a rival company. The law will take the view that inevitably at home they will chat about jobs, even if they try not to, and there's a risk that confidentiality is breached. Confidentiality, uh, confidential information goes from one to the other. You'll be allowed to, to sack that salesman, say, uh, because the risks to the, the, the business, if you like, are too great. There are then a number of uh, unfair dismissals, unfair selection of redundancy. Uh, if you decide you want to be a member of a trade union, that is not grounds for dismissal. If you're pregnant and you're sacked for that, that is unfair uh, dismissal. You are allowed to 